to uh, clarify the title a little, I'll uh, adopt the imagery of the uh, Occupy movement, the imagery that's uh, become uh, familiar, current in the last few months. Uh, them is the 1% and us is the 99%. Of course, this is only imagery. It's not to be taken literally. The leading factor in the uh, astonishing inequality to which the Occupy movement has finally drawn attention uh, actually lies in a fraction of 1% of the population, maybe a tenth of 1%. It's mostly uh, hedge fund managers, uh, CEOs of financial corporations, and, uh, and the like. Uh, this is a product of radical changes in the economy since the 1970s. It uh, initiated a process in which an out-of-control financial sector is eating out the modern market economy from the inside, just as the larva of the spider wasp eats out the host in which it has been laid. Actually, those words are not mine. I couldn't get away with it. I'm quoting uh, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, uh, probably the most respected uh, economic correspondent in the world, suitably conservative. Uh, a uh, related and parallel process has been the deindustrialization of America that's a sharp reversal of centuries of history. It's been a bonanza for the 1% and pretty much of a disaster for the rest. Now, the process is called failure by design in a, by the uh, Economic the Policy Institute. They're the major monitors of uh, the state of working America and not, of course, a failure for the designers as they make clear the designers have been making out like bandits, uh, rather a failure for the rest, including future generations on whom a huge burden is being imposed, uh, one that may be impossible to meet, and again, uh, by design. It's not a law of nature, law of economics, uh, anything else, a planned process. Uh, the uh, Occupy imagery it refers to uh, aspirations and uh, commitments. So take, for example, Martin Luther King. His uh, anniversary was commemorated, celebrated a couple of weeks ago. Uh, King was a leading figure of the 1% that's independent of whatever his personal assets might have been when he was assassinated. And we should recall that he was assassinated while he was supporting a strike of uh, uh, public sector workers, a group that's now targeted for destruction in the current phase of the class war, the vicious class war that's intensified in the last 30 years or so. Uh, he was hoping at the time to carry his dream forward by leading a march of the poor to Washington. The march actually took place uh, starting from the motel where he was assassinated in Memphis, uh, passing through regions where the civil rights struggle had been waged and finally reaching Washington, where the marchers were dismissed with scorn by Congress and uh, driven out of the city by the police who for good measure were ordered to destroy uh, their encampment in Resurrection City. Uh, in the middle of the night, it's, uh, revealing the contempt of uh, Northern liberalism for uh, King when once he went beyond condemning racist Alabama sheriffs to confronting the more fundamental problems of American society in the North as well, the terrible plight of the poor and aggression abroad. At the time, that was the atrocious U.S. war in Indochina. Uh, Martin Luther King's actual dream, uh, and not the one we hear orations about on Martin Luther King Day, the actual one was left in tatters, an unfulfilled legacy 
uh, matters worth contemplating as King is uh, solemnly commemorated. Uh, one vivid illustration of the difference between the crises of the 1% and the 99% is the fate of the congressional legislation that was passed to deal with the catastrophic financial crisis that was created uh, by the 1% and their associates in the uh, political and uh, professional worlds. The government reaction was reviewed by the special inspector general of the Bush-Obama bailout pr programs, uh, Neil Borofsky. Uh, he pointed out that the legislation that authorized the bailout, bailout was two-sided. Uh, it was uh, the financial institutions that were responsible for the collapse. Uh, they were to be saved by the taxpayer, and the victims of their misdeeds were to be very partially compensated uh, by uh, uh, measures to uh, give some protection to home values and to secure owner, home ownership. Well, only one part of the bargain was kept. It didn't take a genius to predict which part. Uh, the financial institutions were rewarded lavishly for causing the crisis. Uh, the TARP bailouts were the least of it. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of the program floundered, uh, quote Borofsky. Uh, foreclosures continued to mount with 8 million to 13 million filings forecast over the program's lifetime, while the biggest banks are 20% larger than they were before the crisis and control a larger part of the, our economy than ever. Uh, furthermore, he went on, they reasonably assume that the government will rescue them again if necessary. Indeed, the credit rating agencies incorporate future government bailouts into their assessments of the largest banks, uh, exaggerating market distortions that provide them with an unfair advantage over smaller institutions, which continue to struggle, and of course, over the 99%. Uh, in short, he concludes, Obama's programs were a giveaway to Wall Street executives and a blow in the solar plexus to their defenseless victims, and very likely a stepping stone towards the next and probably worse financial crisis uh, as business lobbying chips away systematically at the uh, Dodd-Frank regulation bill. Well, these crises have been a regular occurrence since the Reagan years, though there weren't any before. Uh, before that, the New Deal regulatory apparatus remained in place. Uh, that was also the greatest growth period in American economic history, often called golden age by economists. It was also a period of egalitarian growth. The lowest fifth of the population did about as well as the top fifth. Uh, it was also the period in which the modern high-tech economy was founded, uh, very largely in the dynamic state sector of the economy, and not something you read about when you see the encomiums to uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and the others who uh, made use of uh, the contribution of the public uh, to commercialize uh, the work that had been done. Uh, well, at that time, the uh, uh, banks were, were banks. They, were, they did pretty much what a bank is supposed to do in a state capitalist society. Uh, they took unused cop capital, like say uh, your bank accounts, and they uh, transferred them to what was supposed to be some constructive use, like uh, somebody wants to buy a home or uh, send their kids to college or start a business or whatever it may be. Now, that was the golden age. Uh, when deregulation began and uh, the post-war system, so-called Bretton Woods system, uh, was dismantled, that was a system of uh, regulated capital and regulated currencies, when that was dismantled in the 1970s, it led to an extraordinary increase in global capital flow. Uh, banks weren't banks anymore. Now, they became financial casinos, increasingly opaque instruments, uh, all kinds of incentives uh, 
to underestimate risk uh, because, as Borofsky pointed out, uh, the nanny state is counted on to step in when things go sour. Credit rating agencies, as he wrote already, take that for granted. Well, it wasn't very hard to predict what was going to happen. Uh, there were a few international economists who actually did, very few. Uh, one of them was uh, David Felix. He repeatedly warned, quoting him, that the increasing frequency of financial crises during the period of financial liberalization could terminate in an uncontrollable one, a return to the Great Depression, quite close to that. Now, he was joined by a few others, among them uh, John Eatwell and Lance Taylor, well-known British and American economists. Uh, they published in the 90s uh, an important book called uh, Global Finance at Risk. Uh, they discussed the institutional roots of the underestimation of risk, and they proposed uh, means to deal with it. At, at root, the problems result from very well-known inefficiencies of, of markets, inherent inefficiencies of markets, which you learn about in your first semester of economics. Uh, one of these is that transactions in a market system uh, don't take into account the effects of, on others who are not parties to the transaction. So for example, if you sell me a car and we're paying attention, we'll work it out so that we both make out pretty well all right. But we simply don't take into account the effect of that purchase on somebody else, that guy over there. And the effects can be, the effects are real. Uh, there's more pollution, there's more congest, traffic congestion, there are more accidents. And when you multiply these over the population, they, uh, they become substantial. In fact, these externalities, as they're called, un, you don't pay attention to them, they're footnote. Uh, they can be huge. Uh, that's uh, particularly true in the case of financial institutions. So their vocation is to take risks. And if they're well managed, uh, they are supposed to ensure that the potential losses to themselves uh, will be covered. That is, to themselves, uh, under capitalist rules, market rules. It's not their, uh, it's not their business to consider the risk to uh, others. Uh, that's even apart from the uh, uh, nanny state rushing in when things get in trouble, which of course expands the underestimation of risk. But even apart from that, just inherent in a market system is that risk is underpriced uh, because what's called systemic risk, that is the risk to the system at large, uh, is not priced into decisions. So if Goldman Sachs makes a risky uh, transaction investment of some kind or loan or whatever, it presumably, if well managed, covers the risk to itself, uh, even putting aside the fact that the nanny state is there to help it out if, when things go wrong, uh, but it doesn't take into account the risk that if its, say, loan goes bad, the whole system will collapse, which is pretty close to what happened. It insured itself with AIG, AIG tanked, if the government hadn't bailed out AIG, the biggest insurance company, that Goldman Sachs would be, would be bankrupt and uh, uh, other consequences like it would have happened, as would happen in a capitalist society without the nanny state. But the risk is always there and exaggerated, underestimated, just by virtue of the nature of markets. Well, that naturally leads to repeated crises uh, but all such uh, annoying thoughts were put to the side uh, during the period of what's called neo neoliberal globalization. Uh, that kind of settled into dogma from the Reagan-Thatcher years. Uh, also dismissed were occasional warnings to beware of what uh, Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz 15 years ago uh, called the religion that markets know best. Uh, they don't. There are inherent systems, risks that are just part of them and can be very severe and often are. Uh, that's the least of it. But uh, to devout believers who came to dominate the profession, 
and such heresies as regulating financial markets must be dismissed, in fact, dismissed with ridicule, and in fact, they consistently were. Uh, the extremism of the religion was revealed quite graphically just a couple of days ago. The Fed, Federal Reserve, re uh, regularly releases transcripts after five years, and it released transcripts of internal discussions in 2006. Those are very interesting reading. Uh, that was just when the housing bubble was reaching its incredible peak, uh, unnoticed because uh, markets know best. So the fact that in the, in the last few years, housing prices had been shooting way out of sight and breaking a trend line of a century without any basis in any economic fundamentals, that had to be right uh, because markets know best. That's what the religion dictates. Uh, economist uh, Dean Baker, who's one of the very few who foresaw the catastrophe, he could do the arithmetic, which is apparently a rare talent. Uh, he comments that uh, there is no one in the eight Fed meetings reported who suggests that the economy faces any serious turbulence ahead. There is not even discussion that a mild recession could be in sight. There was a concern in the meetings. The concern was inflation, of which there wasn't even a remote sign. Uh, but that's what worries financial institutions. Uh, shortly after the Fed meetings, the huge bubble burst, uh, destroyed trillions of dollars of paper wealth on which much of the public relied, uh, having been deluded into believing that it was safe. For the more deprived parts of the population, like African Americans, it virtually eliminated net worth. That's astonishing when you look at the figures. Well, during these, uh, uh, if you read the transcripts, the, the president of the New York Fed, uh, the one who's primarily in charge of monitoring Wall Street, uh, he captured the uh, general mood among the elite of the profession economics profession when he hailed uh, Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan, uh, who at the time was revered as uh, St. Alan, uh, on the eve of the worst crash since the Great Depression, uh, Timothy Geithner, who it is, who went on to become, uh, was appointed Obama's chief uh, economic manager, he told Greenspan, I'd like the record to show that I think you're pretty terrific. And thinking in terms of probabilities, I think the risk that we decide in the future that you're even better than we think is higher than the alternative. So you're up in the pantheon. Uh, Greenspan himself had not only boasted over the achievements of uh, what economists called the great moderation over which he was presiding, but he even explained how the magical tricks were performed. He's quite frank about it. Uh, during the Clinton years, he informed Congress that uh, one of the ways in which he was achieving these fabulous results was to instill growing worker insecurity. And that's a good thing, he says, because it reduces efforts by working people to try to gain compensation and benefits uh, to mitigate the harsh effects of the great moderation. And that's obviously healthy for the economy. Uh, the religion decrees that uh, those gains should go to the 1%, uh, of course, for the benefit of all by uh, some kind of miracle that never takes place. Uh, after the great crash, 2007, uh, such fundamental market efficiencies, uh, which as I say, you're taught about in the first term of economics, uh, they finally did reach the attention of leading economists. Uh, some of the, one of the leading financial economists wrote that uh, there is growing recognition that our financial system is running a doomsday cycle. Uh, whenever it fails, we rely on lax money and fiscal policies to bail it out. Uh, the response teaches the financial sector lar uh, to take large gambles to uh, to get paid handsomely, and don't worry about the costs, 
Uh, they will be paid by taxpayers through bailouts and lost jobs. And the financial system is uh, uh, resurrected to gamble again. Uh, notice that that's recognizing a kind of a superficial cause of the problem. Now, the deeper cause inherent in market inefficiencies, in this case at least went, went unmentioned, though others mentioned it. Uh, so the system is uh, a doom loop. Those are the words of the official of the Bank of England who's responsible for uh, uh, financial stability. And in fact, so it remains, uh, getting worse. Well, as I mentioned, the a failure by design uh, traces back to the 1970s when there was a substantial redirection of the uh, U.S. economy towards financialization and uh, offshoring of production, deindustrialization. Now, both of these were impelled in part by uh, the falling rate of profit in domestic manufacturing, but also by diversification of the global economy. Uh, by 1970, the global economy was becoming what's called tripolar. You have to recall that after the Second World War, the peak of U.S. power, uh, the U.S. was the one economic center, uh, had half the world's wealth. Uh, other industrial countries had been severely harmed or devastated by the war. The U.S. gained enormously from the war. Industrial production practically quadrupled. And that was the peak of power. Now, the famous American decline that's talked about these days actually started right away, uh, declined very quickly. Uh, the decline is kind of interesting if you think about it. The first step in American decline uh, has a name. It's called the loss of China. It happened in 1949. And then there's huge debate about who's responsible for the loss of China, and a major issue in American domestic policy since that time. It's interesting that the phrase itself is never questioned. You can only lose something that you own. Uh, and it's just taken for granted. Of course we own the world. Uh, how can anyone question that? Uh, so if some part of the world moves towards independence, we've lost it. And then the problem is, you know, who's responsible for the loss? Uh, so in fact, part of the post-war planning, very explicit, was that the U.S. should control the entire Far East, uh, as well as most of the rest. Uh, so that's the beginning of American decline. It keeps going. I won't run through it. Uh, but by 1970, it had reached the point that instead of have, uh, controlling say, half the world's wealth, it had declined to 25%, which is still colossal, but not 50%. And uh, the United States by then was it's about what it is now, incidentally. Uh, the United States was one of three major uh, economic centers. Uh, there was a major center in uh, North America, U.S.-based North America, in another one in German-based Europe, roughly comparable, and a third in East Asia, uh, which was already becoming the most dynamic industrial system in the world. Uh, then it was Japan-based. As soon as it was, that was to be joined by the industrial powerhouses in uh, Japan's former colonies, Taiwan and South Korea, uh, soon later joined by China, uh, which is becoming its assembly plant. Uh, that's actually an important fact to bear in mind when you hear about China's rapid growth, which is indeed spectacular. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, the growth is largely as an assembly plant for the industrial countries on its periphery and for multinational corporations, say like Apple, where they make your iPods and Foxconn. Uh, that's where the high technology comes from, the parts and components, uh, uh, the fancy software, and so on. Uh, China itself mostly assembles them. Uh, that means, incidentally, that the trade deficit with China that you hear about all the time is severely miscalculated, which has been pointed out. In fact, if you calculate the trade deficit by what's called value added, how much value is actually added at each step of the manufacturing process, then the trade deficit with China reduces by about 25%. And it goes up by the same figure, approximately, with uh, the peripheral industrial countries. And of course, US manufacturers make a 
to gain from it as well, not the population. Now, there's a recent study by the Sloan Foundation that goes into this and it gives some illustrations. Uh, uh, one illustration is an iPod. Uh, they say if, you have, if there's an iPod assembled and exported from China, it costs, they estimate, $150 to produce, and China adds $4 to that. The rest is coming from the outside. Uh, well, under these conditions, namely uh, you know, decline in the rate of profit in manufacturing, uh, uh, diversification of the economy, opportunities for production abroad, and so on, under those conditions, uh, financial manipulations and overseas operations became much more profitable for the designers of the economy who designed a failure, as the EPI points out. Uh, what that did is it set off a, a vicious cycle of uh, greater concentration of wealth, increasingly in the financial sector, which just exploded. Uh, that lit, uh, con concentration of wealth leads almost automatically, to concentration of political power. And that, in turn, leads to legislation, which carries the cycle forward. Uh, so things like fiscal measures, you know, changing tax burdens and so on, uh, deregulation, the rules of corporate governance that give more power to uh, the chief executive, and a lot more. Uh, meanwhile, what remained of functioning democracy, rapidly declining, was shredded further as the cost of elections skyrocketed. That drives the political parties deeper, even deeper than before, they were always there, but even deeper than before into corporate pockets, that's where the money is. Uh, the Republicans did it so enthusiastically that they scarcely even resemble a traditional political party anymore. The, uh, which is part of the reason for the near lunacy of the Republican debates. We can talk about that. <laughs> if you abandon any pretense of being a political party, you have to mobilize voters somehow. And you can't do it on the basis of your policies. You, know, you can't go to the voting public and say, hey, uh, our only policy is to enrich the super rich and uh, impoverish you. So you have to organize other constituencies, uh, groups that are always there, you know, but they, had never, they weren't really mobilized as a political force in earlier years. Uh, that includes a religious, I would, could use the word extremist, meaning by, comparative, by world standards, but they're not extremists by US standards. The country's kind of off the spectrum in religious extremism and has been for a long time, in fact, since the colonists. But they weren't organized as a political force very much, and now they are. That's a big voting constituency. Uh, nativists who are uh, consumed with uh, hate and fear, they're always there, uh, but now they're organized. Uh, small businessmen who feel that the world's turning against them, they don't like the big corporations, they don't like the government, they don't like anybody, uh, they can be organized. And uh, uh, other sectors like that, I kind of hate to say it, but those of you who know something about modern history will recognize that this is somewhat similar to the constituencies that uh, big industrialists uh, mobilized in Germany in the late Weimar Republic, which became the Nazi, which was the Nazi Party. And they thought they could control them, but it turned out they couldn't. That's a lot of dissimilarities, but some unpleasant similarities too. Uh, anyhow, when you mobilize those constituencies, and that's who you have to talk to then the debates and the so-called debates, you know, the, the catechism and so on, is going to be like what you see on television. It's kind of amazing, the world. There's nothing like it in any parliamentary system, but it's almost inevitable once a political party abandons any pretense of being a political party and just is completely in service to a tiny sector, a fraction of the 1%. Well, uh, that's the vicious cycle. Uh, the Democrats who, actually the Democrats today are what used to be called moderate Republicans. Uh, moderate Republicans, it's sometimes said that they're gone. They're not gone. They're centrist Democrats or even center left Democrats. Uh, they're not far behind. All of that's part of the vicious cycle. <laughs>
Well, actually, a lot of what's going on is in accord with a, a maxim of Adam Smith's that should actually be known better. Uh, back in Wealth of Nations, 1776, he wrote that, uh, of course, he's interested in England. He wrote that in England, the principal architects of government policy are the people who own the economy. In his day, the merchants and manufacturers of England, they set policy and they design it so as to ensure that their own interests are uh, very well attended to, however grievous the effect on others, including the people of England, uh, but in particular the, those overseas, like uh, those in India who were suffering what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans, the British in that case, as he knew. Well, that's, that's a pretty good principle of politics. It, held well in 1770s, it's slightly different today. It's not merchants and manufacturers, it's uh, financial institutions and multinational corporations. But the general maxim uh, holds pretty well. You can make it more complex and sophisticated, but as a kind of a simple first approximation, it's not bad and very dramatic today. Well, it's also worth remembering that the founders of classical economics, that's uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, uh, they were, uh, they uh, uh, could predict the, what's, what's been happening today, and in fact they did. They warned about what would, they recognized would be a nightmare of what's now called neoliberal globalization, uh, what the 99% have been enduring here and much harsher and long familiar in uh, uh, poorer countries. So for example, Adam Smith uh, discussed what would happen if in England, uh, the merchants and manufacturers decided to basically abandon England to invest abroad and import from abroad. Uh, he pointed out that they may, might do very well in, under those circumstances, but it would be very harsh for England However, he argued that this is not going to happen because of a phenomenon that's sometimes called home bias. The merchants and manufacturers would prefer to do business at home, uh, uh, to invest at home and to uh, get their commodities or products from home. And then he said, because of this, uh, as if by an invisible hand, England will be saved from the ravages of uh, what we call neoliberal globalization. Uh, that phrase, invisible hand, is a pretty hard one to miss. It's the only occurrence, the one occurrence of the phrase in his classic Wealth of Nations. So if you look it up in the index, that's the passage it'll take to you, uh, you to. It's basically a critique of uh, neoliberal globalization and a description of what's happening now. Uh, he was not alone. His, you know, was the next great uh, political economist, David Ricardo, classic, classic economist, he recognized the same thing. He, point, he, he recognized that his famous law of comparative advantage it would collapse if uh, uh, you know, his England-Portugal model, if the uh, uh, British investors and merchants did everything in Portugal. Uh, they'd do fine, but England would collapse. And he uh, said it wouldn't happen. He hoped it wouldn't happen. He was a little more sentimental about it than Adam Smith. He hoped it wouldn't happen. He hoped that because of home bias, I'll quote him, most men of property would be satisfied with a low rate of profits in their own country rather than seek a more advantageous employment for their wealth in foreign nations feelings that I, I should be sorry to see weakened, he said. Well, that's what happened uh, dramatically in the past uh, generation. That leads to the process of uh, eating out the market of economy like the larva of a wasp, quote Martin Wolf again, and destruction of the manufacturing base of the economy at home uh, with all that that entails, and it's quite serious. Well, the 1% can survive on finance and uh, profits from production survive very well, at least temporarily. 
uh, production under absolutely hideous conditions at monstrosities like Foxconn, Taiwanese-owned uh, uh, corporation where they produce your iPods and other Apple products and others. Uh, but the 99% uh, can't survive on this. And there are other effects, uh, longer-term effects. Uh, one of them is loss of the technological edge. Uh, that's another debt we're imposing on uh, future generations. Uh, there's a, to take one rather striking illustration, there is a rapidly growing market for solar panels, uh, growing very fast. It's now been largely taken over by China. Uh, the, uh, the US uh, uh, Secretary of Energy, physicist Stephen Chu, uh, he warned recently to Congress that the United States is falling behind in advanced manufacturing and he took as Exhibit A uh, solar panel manufacturing. He toured one of the main Chinese factories and he reported, it's a high-tech automated factory. It's not succeeding because of cheap labor, uh, rather uh, because of sensible planning, uh, the government making, creating opportunities for uh, infrastructure, for suppliers, and so on. The kind of a synergies develop also for uh, 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 Apple products, as was discussed recently in the New York Times. Uh, so he said it started, uh, the factory started with very low tech manufacturing, but there's a general phenomenon which is well known to industrial engineers. Uh, manufacturing capacity provides the basis and the stimulus for design, uh, innovation, and rising to uh, higher levels of sophistication in, in production and design and invention. A lot of it comes from the factory floor, just to trying things out, seeing what works, getting new ideas, and so on. Uh, and in fact, it's gotten to the point, Chu points out, where the Chinese have now developed a type of solar cell with world record efficiencies. So China's forging ahead in this essential market, and it might in others too, as the 99% here languish, again, by design. Now, I mentioned that China, to this day, is still primarily an assembly plant, but it's going to move up the technology ladder in ways like this, and we're uh, helping it out and helping others out to gain a technological edge, which we'll lose. At industrial countries, too. Germany's doing quite well, for example. Well, a good illustration of the design is uh, President Obama's economic team. When he came into office, it was in the midst of this uh, terrible uh, collapse. So he had the first thing he had to do was appoint an economic team. And it was very interesting to see how he appointed. He avoided everyone who had criticized uh, the, uh, pr the uh, uh, decisions and the procedures that were leading to the crisis, included Nobel laureates. They were out, period. Uh, the ones who came in were the ones who designed the crisis, uh, Robert Rubin's boys, basically. And that was noticed. Uh, the business press noticed it. Uh, so Bloomberg News, one of the main business journals, uh, they actually uh, did a review of, uh, of Obama's economic team, one by one, talked about their records. And their conclusion was that uh, uh, most of these guys uh, shouldn't be on an economic team. They should be getting subpoenas. Well, that's uh, correct. Uh, there was, in fact, one exception uh, representing the liberal left uh, called for some kind of regulation. That was Paul Volcker, uh, just to place him in the spectrum. He was Reagan's treasury secretary. But by the you know, last couple of years, that puts him somewhere on the left. Uh, he, uh, anyway, he didn't last very long. He was thrown out. He was replaced, Obama replaced him by Jeffrey Immelt. He's the CEO of General Electric. That's the nation's largest corporation. And the business world was quite pleased. They were glad to get rid of Volcker, radical leftist. And they trusted <laughs> Immelt. Uh, so London Financial Times pointed out that Mr. Immelt's appointment was applauded by the US Chamber of Commerce, main big business lobby. Uh, which has been among the president's harsher critics and funded 
notice, funded many Republicans who ran against Democrats in November's elections. This is right after the 210 election. Uh, so the last barrier to unimpeded business rule is out of the way. We can all be happy in the 1%. Well, you take a look at GE. Uh, the, this appointment, incidentally, was uh, heralded as to create jobs. Okay, that's Jeffrey M. Elt's uh, mission. Uh, more than half of GE's workforce is abroad. Uh, more than half of its revenues come from overseas operations, uh, also very substantially from, uh, not from production, but from uh, financial manipulations. It is now doing some hiring, but at much lower salaries. Uh, the workforce has been so beaten down by class war, by unemployment, designed unemployment, that they don't object. And they're glad to have any work at all. Uh, this practice that GE is now illustrating of two-tier contracts, you know, old contracts for the unionized workforce that you can't get rid of yet, they're trying to get rid of them, but much uh, uh, lower pay and much worse benefits for all new workers, that uh, two-tiered contract system, uh, it goes back to the Reagan years. It's a core part of the uh, bitter and very self-conscious class war of the past generation. Well, the Imelt appointment, as I said, was proclaimed by the White House to be for job growth, but it had very little to do with that. Uh, more accurately, it's what's called follow the money. Uh, more than a century ago, uh, the great political financier Mark Hanna uh, said that three things are important in politics. Money, money, and I've forgotten the third one. Uh, <laughs> that's far more true today than it was uh, a century ago, especially after the changes of radical changes of the past 30 years. Well, the consequent and perfectly predictable decline of and in fact intended, a decline of democracy is evident every day on the front pages. So right now, for example, in Washington, uh, the great issue of the day is the deficit. For the general public, uh, the great issue of the day is jobs. And on strictly economic grounds, uh, the public is right. Uh, there are very few serious economists who question this. So in fact, the reasons are explained in the most prestigious uh, places, including the business press. I'll quote again Martin Wolf, the London Financial Times correspondent, who's maybe the most respected econ economic correspondent in the world. He writes that the U.S. fiscal position is not an urgent issue. The U.S. is now able to borrow on easy terms. The astonishing feature of the federal fiscal position is that revenues are forecast to be a mere 14.4% of gross domestic product in 2011, uh, far below their post-war average of close to 8%. Uh, individual income tax is forecast to be barely 6% of GDP in 2011. This non-American cannot understand what the fuss is about in 1988, at the end of Ronald Reagan's term, uh, receipts were uh, uh, three times that high, over 18% of GDP. Uh, tax revenue has to rise substantially if the deficit is to close. And of course, that means rise substantially on the sectors of the population where it's been sharply reduced, uh, the rich, especially the super rich and the corporate sector. Well, it is astonishing, but it's not hard to understand. It's the demand of the financial institutions and the super rich. And in a rapidly declining democracy, that's what counts. Those are the voices that are heard. And as an instrument of class war, uh, the policies that the public strongly opposes uh, make perfectly good sense. Actually, much the same is true these days in continental Europe. Uh, there are two uh, leading economists, uh, financial press, even the International Monetary Fund, uh, point out that the policies of the European Central Bank, uh, which are much more reactionary than the Fed, uh, 
uh, their policies imposing austerity during recession are almost certain to undermine growth and even to undermine debt repayment, which is exactly what's been happening. Now, the, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, recently did a survey of several hundred cases uh, uh, of uh, a, applying austerity during recession. And they showed that in, uniformly it undermines growth and even undermines debt repayment, which is not too surprising. Uh, what's needed is economic stimulus, and Europe has plenty of resources for that. Uh, so on economic grounds, it doesn't make any sense. But on grounds of class warfare, it's kind of sensible. Uh, it's a way to undermine hated social programs, uh, to weaken labor, and to entrench uh, corporate control even more than before. So the programs that the public strenuously opposes are quite rational. It's more failure by design. Well, even if you keep to the secondary issue of the deficit, the radical decline of democracy I'm speaking of here uh, stares us in the face. So the public has views on how to deal with the deficit, uh, large majorities. Raise taxes on the rich, even if not anywhere near the level of the great growth periods, but raise them. Uh, and uh, safeguard the benefit systems, uh, Medicare, Social Security. Now, even Tea Party adherents insist on that. Uh, the financial institutions demand the opposite. So therefore, it's the opposite that's on the agenda. Uh, for Republicans, it's part of the catechism that you have to solemnly intone, uh, lockstep, uh, rather in the style of the old Communist Party. You just got to repeat it. Uh, and the Democrats, again, are not all that far behind, a couple of steps behind. Well, there is something that's undiscussable. Now, that is a very obvious and well-known way to eliminate the deficit totally and, in fact, to create a surplus. And that is to uh, uh, reform the scandalous health care system, and not by some utopian means, and just to make it like other industrial countries. You know, that's kind of not outer space. Uh, so the US health system, which is uh, unique in a number of ways. One is that it's privatized and unregulated, hence extremely inefficient. Layer after layer of bureaucracy, tons of administrative costs, uh, uh, profit making, advertising, all sorts of things which uh, take funds away from uh, treatment of people. And of course, all kind of measures. And after all, these are profit making institutions. They're, there to make profit, not to cure people. So they try to do it, and they try to do it by all sorts of ways to defer or prevent uh, treatment if they can get away with it. That's kind of automatic. And it's about uh, twice the per capita costs, even more, of comparable countries that does not translate into health benefits. In fact, the US comes out sort of at the low end of industrial societies and health outcomes. Uh, but that's a huge cost. And in fact, if, it, if we did institute a healthcare system like other countries, the deficit would be wiped out. And in fact, there'd be a surplus. But that's not part of the debate uh, over the deficit. It's not discussed in the media. The financial institutions don't want it. End of story. Uh, there actually is a far more ominous component of the failure by design. Now, that's not just for the 99%, but for the, but for their children and the grandchildren, and those are the 1% too. And that's environmental catastrophe. Uh, there have been a number of major emissions reports in the last couple of weeks, uh, one from the International Energy Association, which is a pretty conservative body. It was founded by Henry Kissinger. Now, they came out with their regular report uh, uh, indicating that emissions, you know, greenhouse emissions were far beyond what had been anticipated. And their chief economist warned that we may have about five years uh, before the window closes, as he put it. We'll reach the point in global warming, which is irreversible, assumed to be irreversible. From then on, it just explodes. Uh, and these are what are called nonlinear processes, you know, it can explode pretty fast. Uh, so we got five years, 
their emissions are getting worse than ever. Uh, right before that, a couple of weeks before that, the US uh, energy uh, monitors, energy department, produced its estimates, uh, which similar said it's for, 19, it's for 2010, the last figures. They said it was the greatest rise ever and it was worse than the worst case scenario of the uh, IPCC, you know, the international uh, uh, monitors, the scientists group that monitors emissions. They have a spectrum of uh, more optimistic, less, more pessimistic uh, uh, estimates, and this was worse than the worst of them. I should say that where I am at MIT, that didn't come as any surprise. The, there is a climate change study group at MIT, and they've been saying for years that they're and publishing the fact that their own models uh, uh, suggest that the IPC consensus is, uh, even, and even its worst case, is far too optimistic. Well, that's what the latest emissions report shows. Uh, Congress reacted to this. Uh, they reacted by uh, enacting a problem uh, and can't do that, so therefore we can't inquire into it. Uh, it's kind of similar to the National Rifle Association, which for decades has prevented any legislation would, which would lead to an inquiry, no action, just an inquiry into the, whether there's a relation between guns and homicides. I mean, it's clear what they're going to find out, but you can't inquire into it. It's too dangerous. Uh, well, uh, uh, meanwhile, Congress, Republican Congress, is, uh, is busy. It's dismantling environmental measures that are on the books, uh, the ones introduced by Richard Nixon, who was in many ways the last liberal president. Uh, Eisenhower would look like some kind of flaming radical today. Uh, so all the more evidence about how the, uh, both the doctrinal and policy spectrum has shifted to the right. Uh, on climate, there are international polls taken by the Pew Foundation it turns out that across the world, a, a large majority of the population is very much concerned about uh, uh, the environmental catastrophe. Uh, even in the United States, uh, there's considerable concern, although the United States is much lower than other countries, and much less concern, less belief that it's real, which is why every Republican candidate can say, and indeed must say, it doesn't exist or it's not a problem and get away with it. Uh, in the United States, this figure has been going down for the last couple of years, concern for uh, climate, you know, the problems of climate. And it's certainly correlated with a massive corporate propaganda campaign, which was openly announced and nothing secret about it. You could read in the New York Times that uh, after the success of the insurance companies in beating back health reform, and turning the Obama program into a kind of a gift to them, which indeed it was. Uh, after their success, the Chamber of Commerce, American Petroleum Institute, and others announced that they're going to use the same methods to uh, try to undermine the concern over global warming. And it's big, been a big uh, campaign. It's apparently had a substantial effect. And that's all a direct consequence of the shift of power towards uh, unaccountable private tyrannies and the uh, religion, and it is a religion, that uh, there must be no public interference in their pursuit of short-term profit and power. Well, it's easy and convenient to make fun of the Republican congressman who uh, explained that there can't be any environmental problems because God promised Noah that there would never be another flood. Uh, <laughs> That's easy, we can laugh about it. It's less easy, less convenient, and far more significant to pay attention to the secular religious extremism that's all around us, right in our circles, uh, our own enlightened circles, the kind that I mentioned. And this indeed goes well beyond what I've already mentioned, that it in, in, uh, involves crises that uh, uh, are far graver than the failure by design in the rich countries from which the 99% are suffering. Uh, among these many crises, and there are plenty of them, uh, there's one that ought to be of prime concern for us, and that is just on moral grounds, uh, the ones 
the crises affecting the victims of our crimes. Well, these are ranged too widely to talk about, but I'll just end by bringing up one quite striking case, which happens to teach us a good deal about ourselves if we choose to learn from it. Uh, as you know, uh, anniversaries of important events uh, are often uh, commemorated, uh, uh, sometimes quite solemnly, like uh, Pearl Harbor Day. But there are some that are forgotten. And they have lessons, too. So I'll mention one. Uh, we are now reaching the 50th anniversary uh, of the date when President John F. Kennedy uh, launched a direct US invasion of South Vietnam. Just 50 years ago, he shifted US policy from support of a brutal client regime that had killed tens of thousands of people and elicited resistance that it couldn't subdue. Uh, he shifted policy from support for them to a direct US attack. Uh, that included bombing by US aircraft, the use of napalm, a program uh, chemical warfare, uh, programs that ultimately drove millions of people, villagers, into urban slums or what amounted to concentration camps, in which the story was they would be protected from the indigenous guerrillas, uh, who, in fact, the administration knew they were willingly supporting. Well, I'll quote official sources from 50 years ago. Uh, President Kennedy authorized use of US forces in a sharply increased uh, effort to avoid a further deterioration of the situation in South Vietnam, including increased airlift to the government of Vietnam, that's the US client regime, which until virtually the end declared itself to be the government of all Vietnam. Uh, the, uh, this increased airlift included helicopters, light aviation, transport air, aircraft, equipment, and US personnel for aerial reconnaissance, instruction in an execution of air ground support, special intelligence, uh, aircraft personnel, and chemical defoliants to kill Viet Cong food crops and defoliate selected border and jungle areas. Uh, spraying equipment was installed on the H-34 helicopters uh, and is ready to be used against food crops. The, this is 1961, 1960, early 62. The defoliants included Agent Orange, that's laden with dioxin, which was known to be, by the manufacturers at least, was known to be one of the most lethal carcinogens that anyone knows about. And it exacted a pretty terrifying toll on the invading armies, and of course, far worse horrors uh, for the civilian population, it still does. Uh, you find aborted, hideously malformed fetuses in Saigon hospitals uh, several generations down the line. And notice that all of this is an attack on South Vietnam. Uh, the short-term effects were reported by uh, the most uh, highly respected uh, uh, Indochina specialist, military historian Bernard Fall, who was no dove, incidentally, but he was one of the few who cared about the people of the tormented countries. So in early 1965, he estimated that about 66,000 had been killed between 1957 and 1961 under the US-imposed terror state, and another 90,000 between 1961, when policy was shifted in April 1965, uh, during the early stages of the Kennedy-Johnson aggression, virtually all of them South Vietnamese, mostly victims of the US client regime, or as he put it, the crushing weight of American armor, napalm, jet bombers, and finally, vomiting gases. Well, the decisions of 50 years ago were largely kept from the American people, the pieces dribbled out, and so are the shocking consequences that persist. Uh, the first study of the continuing impact of chemical warfare on South Vietnamese, destruction of food crops and so on. First study of that just appeared in 
by Fred Wilcox a couple of months ago. I doubt very much that it'll even be reviewed. Well, despite the silence, information did trickle through to give at least some sense of what was happening. Uh, but efforts at justification were pretty slim because nobody really cared. Uh, hardly more than President Kennedy's uh, impassioned address to the General Assembly, UN General Assembly, uh, where he warned that we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covered means for extending its sphere of influence. And if the conspiracy achieves its ends in Laos and Vietnam, the gates will be opened wide. Conspiracies in the Kremlin, there weren't any Russians anywhere near sight. But they were the sort of the monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that was doing all these things. About the same time, he warned that, as he put it, the complacent, the self-indulgent, the soft societies are about to be swept away with the debris of history, and only the strong can possibly survive. Now, that was his lament after the failure of the invasion of Cuba, the Bay of Pigs invasion, a warning that have got to do something about it. Uh, well, hardly necessary to spell out the actual basis for these grim pronouncements, uh, since so few people were even paying attention to what was actually being done. And the invasion itself passed with hardly more than a yawn. Well, that was 1961. Uh, years later, by 1967, uh, opposition to the crimes did reach a substantial scale. But by that time, uh, hundreds of thousands of US troops and tens of thousands of virtual mercenaries were rampaging through the country. Uh, heavily populated areas were subjected to saturation bombing. And by then, the invasion had spread to the rest of Indochina. And the consequences had become so horrendous that Bernard Fall again forecast that Vietnam as a cultural and historic entity is threatened with extinction as the countryside literally dies under the blows of the largest military machine ever unleashed on an area of this size. And he was again referring to South Vietnam, which was always the main target up to that point. Uh, the war went on for another eight horrendous years. And mainstream was, opinion was divided between those who described the war as a noble cause that could have been won with more dedication. And at the opposite extreme, the critics, to whom it was a mistake that proved too costly, kind of like the German general staff after Stalingrad. That's the liberals. Uh, by 1977, uh, President Carter uh, aroused almost no notice when he explained that we owe Vietnam no debt because the destruction was mutual. Uh, practically no comment. Well, still to come after Falls, uh, Bernard Falls' grim warning was the bombing of the remote uh, peasant society of northern Laos, a bombing with such intensity that the victims lived in caves for years to try to survive, a bombing that had almost nothing to do with the Vietnam War, had mostly to do with the fact there were a lot of bombers around with nothing much to do. Uh, shortly after that came the bombing of rural Cambodia at the incredible level of all allied uh, uh, air operations in the entire Pacific theater during World War II, including two atom bombs. Uh, that's rural Cambodia. Uh, all of this was under Henry Kissinger's orders. Uh, anything that flies on anything that moves. Now, that's a call for genocide of a kind that's very hard to find in the archival record. Uh, it's kind of known, but disregard it. Uh, these were what are called secret wars, in the, uh, meaning reporting of what was available. Uh, even what was available was very scanty. And the facts are still barely known to the general public or even educated elites, uh, people who can recite by heart. Uh, every real or alleged crime of official enemies. Uh, these are all matters that reflect, that merit reflection, uh, not about uh, you know, the Republican base, but about ourselves and 
our communities and those we live in. Uh, and they also merit action. And there is finally some action. The Occupy movements are first large-scale popular response to the growing crisis of the past generation. Maybe they can go beyond what they've done. I hope so. They have achieved a great deal. And if they can overcome the inevitable repression already underway, and if they can find ways to expand into the general community and to deepen the insight that they're trying to provide, that could prove to be a, a development of historical significance. And whether that'll happen is essentially up to us to determine, uh, just as it's up to us to determine whether, say, Martin Luther King's uh, dream is uh, to remain as in tattered ruins or can, in fact, be realized. 